welcome uh, back. We're going to talk about understanding software vulnerabilities. This is going to be a quick crash course in C programming, um, a little bit about what assembly is, um, and we're going to talk about uh, buffer overflow. So an initial um, explanation of, about what a buffer overflow is, how to stack smashing work, and we'll go into a little bit more detail in the following weeks on those things as well. So the problem is that even if a software author is actually trying to do the right thing and they're just trying to create a secure piece of software, they don't have any malicious intention, it's still quite easy to make a programming mistake which results in huge security problems. Um, and it happens you know, all the time. If you go onto a website like um, BugTrack or you go to um, Security Focus or something like that, you can look at all these vulnerabilities that are discovered basically on a, a daily basis. All these programming mistakes that people have made without intentionally introducing a security problem and, and it gets introduced and um, you know, understanding that is what this is all about. So how do we go about understanding the kinds of programming mistakes that get made? So some basic um, terminology, and for most of you this is going to be revision. So software vulnerability is a weakness in the security of a program. So um, often that's a design decision mistake or an implementation mistake. So they just haven't thought through the solution properly or they've made a mistake while implementing the solution. So a little programming mistake. Um, and an exploit is basically a piece of software or an action that basically takes advantage of a vulnerability. So for example, it might cause a buffer overflow or command injection and the, the result might be that the, the attacker can make the system do things that you didn't want it to be able to do. So for example, worst case scenario, which is quite common, an attacker sends some information to a computer that wasn't programmed to process that information correctly and as a result, the attacker basically takes control of that computer. Um, so that's uh, arbitrary code execution. Uh, or maybe they can make it make some changes to a database, uh, or they basically crash the computer. So um, those are some of the results. So the kinds of payloads that can occur as a result of, of that is information leakage. We might be able to do denial of service. Um, or basically allow the, the attacker to run some code. And often that's shell code, so which basically gives the attacker the ability to interact with uh, a command line prompt on that machine. Um, so that's what we don't want, basically. Um, and the programming languages that we're going to look at is C and C++. Um, and one of the reasons we're doing that is because it's very popular. Uh, they're very, very commonly used programming languages. Um, but also the very low level programming languages compared to some that are used. And that means that they're very prone to error. So it's very easy. It's easier to make a mistake that causes security problems in C or C++ compared to like Java or Ruby or, or Python. Um, but all of those languages are <laughs> worth learning, obviously. Um, Java has some really interesting security features. It's used on Android. It's used for you know serv servers, web servers, or desktops, or all sorts of things. Um, scripting languages are also very helpful from a security testing point of view, or exploit development point of view. But in terms of understanding vulnerabilities, C is going to give us. A, a, it's going to be a lot easier for us to see the kinds of mistakes that get made. Is it same as C sharp, because that's the only one I've used BB and C sharp no. only in the programming. Are they about the same or? Does anyone want to answer that question? The difference between? Well, between what C and C sharp. C sharp's uh, Microsoft Python is pretty high level Python with Java. Yeah, that's, that's right. C, C sharp is basically Microsoft's Java. Yeah, um, working in your Visual Studio, isn't it? Yeah, it's. it's it compiles down to a byte code as opposed to an executable. So when you compile a C program, you end up with a program that the CPU understands. When you compile down Java or C sharp, you get a program that you need a Java interpreter yes. to, to run or a .NET. You know. um, so yeah, pro C has been, according to the I don't even know how you would go about pronouncing that. The TIO 
B E um, community index. C is basically currently the most popular programming language um, in the world, and they they basically it gives an indication of the popularity of different programming languages based on a whole bunch of searches on the internet, like, like Google, you know, and all those sorts of things. Um, I think it even includes YouTube tutorials and things like that. So C, this is so this is very current. So as of January in 2015, uh, C is currently the most popular according to this index, uh, followed by Java, Objective C, um, which is Apple's um, programming language, and C++ and C sharp. So and it's it's been at number one for a while. So you know it is a good programming language to study. Um, and if we look at over time, you can see C has basically stayed, you know, as a popular programming language. Okay, so here's an example of a very basic C program that just prints to the screen, hello world. So just to, to quickly give you a description of, of what the code means, we've got here, number one is a comment. Because anything that starts with a forward slash and an asterisk until the next asterisk and forward slash will get ignored by the compiler. So this gets doesn't actually run. This isn't code. It's just comments for the for us to understand the code. Line two here, we've got um, include stdio, which stands for standard input output dot h. So this basically imports um, some libraries that we can use. Number three is a definition of a function. So it says int which just means that this function returns an integer um, and is called main, which every single C program will have a main function. That just is where the code starts. Um, and within that, on number four, we've got printf, hello world. Printf is a function that gets um, imported from standard IO. So that's what that, you know, number two basically allows us to run, have that fourth, you know, the fourth line there, printf. And obviously, it's just a function, so it's the printf function, and then in brackets is the stuff we're passing into that function. And inside some quotes, we've got hello, comma, world, because we know how to do grammar correctly. Um, and the, the slash n is a new line character, so that it goes on to the next line and then get prompt on the next line. So that is a basic C program. It's, it will end the integer <coughs> after the uh... um, Actually. It says it's going to return an integer, but because it's the uh, we haven't. A, Sorry. Do you have to define the integer? Uh, if because so the return value can be an integer, but I haven't actually returned. You can put return zero at the end, yeah. or return you know an error. Uh, but in this case, it, this is basically ignored at this stage. So. So, so like in C sharp, it's all just writing read line and write line. You just type in like this. And yes. Know. Yeah. So these are a slightly more complicated example with a variable. So char, name, and then square brackets three. Can anyone tell me what the square brackets is for? Uh, is it an array? Yes. So it's an array with three elements. Um, so an array is a variable that has multiple values. And there's, there's multiple characters. Um, the um, C doesn't have a string type. So, you know, in Java and stuff, and C Sharp, or these other languages that are a bit more complicated, you can have an actual string. In, in C, like pure C, you have an array of characters. So when we ask, what is your name? And we, we get S, which is a way of reading from the user into a um, variable. So let's just ignore this as casting for now. Basically, we've got get S, reading into the value name. Um, and that's going to basically stop, wait till the user types something in, and it's going to put the result they've typed in into that name um, array. Uh, or you could call it a string if you want, a C string. And then we've got printf, um, and then hello, and it, whatever their name is. So the number three is pointing at percent %s, which is a format string, which means put a string here. And then after the format string, we've got comma name. It's going to look at the arguments after the string to fulfill those format strings. So it looks for something to put in the percent %s, takes that name and prints it out. So it just says, hello, whatever you've typed in for their name. 
Um, here's another example. We've got a um, string with five characters called execute. Uh, and in that, we can just directly assign it to have the value ls, which is obviously the Linux command to list files. Um, and then the second one, we've got system, which is a way of executing a command, execute. So that's actually going to run from bash the command ls. So what's wrong with this, this program? There's a security problem here. Um, we've, and this is basically just a combination of those two examples I've just shown you. Yes, that is a hundred. That is correct. Um, sorry. Um, no. Um, so you're right, though, Solomon. You're right. Um, so let's see if anyone. So, can you explain why? Um, well, if you put more than three characters oh. in the name, it could start overwriting the variable and execute. Yes. Okay. That that is that is a good answer. So, okay. So we've got a, an array called execute, which has five characters. We've got a name with three characters, and we're asking them for a name, storing the value into name, and then we're saying hello, whatever their name is, executing the command, whatever the command is. Uh, and then we sleep for two seconds and we actually execute that command. Um, and as Matthew has quite rightly pointed out, we've not given much space for their name to be stored, right? Three characters, not many people's names are going to fit in that, but it's just a nice simple example. You type more than three characters and strange things are going to start happening. So it's basically, yeah, it's going to overwrite this other variable and change the behavior of this program. So get s is bad. You should never ever use get s in a, in a C program um, because there's no secure way of using get s. Um, and it was commonly used in, pro, in programs for a long time. It was like a standard function that people would use. Nowadays it's like just don't use it because it, there's no way to tell it to just like be safe. It'll just keep reading stuff in. So even though the code looks at first read through like it's perfectly safe, it's just the the execute variable has ls in it, uh, and then we're executing that. There's nothing in this code that sets execute to a different value, um, but the you know as as Matthew pointed out, you can overflow into the other variable name, and as um, Salman said, it's true. You basically if for the input. You entered something and then a bunch of spaces and then some command or something, that command is going to end up getting written into that other variable. So in this example, we, we store some, we basically enter something a bit weird for our name, um, and that's going to change the value of execute, and then you see the command here that gets run is actually id instead of ls. So software bugs is a big problem, and it has been for a really long time. Uh, the, the name soft like bug comes from an actual moth apparently that was found in a um, computer at Harvard University back in the day 1947 um, and it's it's really easy to make those sorts of pro program mistakes and actually it's quite hard to not make programming mistakes um, so the kinds of mistakes that happen <coughs> is bounds checking like what we just saw there's nothing in the code that checked how long that input was when we were storing it in um, and sanitized input is a huge problem. So when we get something from the user and we don't check what they've entered and we just start using it as though what they've given us makes sense, that causes problems often. Race conditions, which is when the timing is a bit off, the things that happen, if the timing is important within your code, then that could be a security problem. Um, you know, pointers and strings and all that sort of stuff, can, you know, can you, you can do badly. And it, obviously, misconfigurations and access controls not done right and things like that can cause security problems. So we're going to look at each of those things in the module. So C is, is, is our example programming language. It was developed to create the, the Unix operating system. Um, it's tied very closely to the Unix system calls. Um, but obviously, C is used for all sorts of different things and not just for Unix. Um, so Linux kernel in its entirety 
other than a couple of small binary blobs is basically written in C. Um, and C is a subset of C++. So if you're wondering the difference between C and C++, C++ is all of C plus some extra fancy things to the object-oriented programming. But everything you can do in C, you could directly write into a C++ program and it will work. So um, C++ is a superset. So it includes C plus some extra features. Um, so yeah, programming, um, quite, quite popular. So um, it's fairly low level. It's very mature. It's been around for a long time. It doesn't have all the kinds of security features and primitives built into other languages. So things like Java has kind of some, some very cool security features ba baked into the language. Whereas C, it's like an afterthought, basically. Um, so there's all kinds of um, security errors that we understand really well now. Because C's been around for such a long time. Um, often when we talk about things like a buffer overflow, it really makes a lot of sense when you're looking at C code. And when you're looking at something like Java, it's a bit more complicated. Um, but the security concepts apply um, across you know, different languages. So C kind of leaves a lot of the, um, the work to the programmer. So unlike something like Java, C doesn't actually enforce things like sane data copying. So C will actually happily let a programmer ask for things that just don't make sense. So you could copy, um, you can basically write C code that will say, you know, copy this information into somewhere in memory that hasn't even been allocated yet. It's never going to work. It's going to cause the program to crash. The language itself will happily let the program ask for that. Um, you might copy a value from um, directly out of memory somewhere else into memory ignoring like what data types there are. So you might copy from a string into a integer or you know weird stuff like that. You, if you co if you if you want to you can force it to let you do all sorts of crazy things that make no sense. The programming language basically gives you the keys to the kingdom and just says go for it. Like you know you can do all kinds of things, which is also one of its strengths because you can do some incredibly powerful tricks to make your code super optimal and do fast very fast calculations and things like that, but it does mean that it's, it's harder not to make mistakes. So it's not going to enforce bounds checking either. So if you're copying from a string into another string, it's, the programming language itself isn't going to force you to um, do something that makes sense. So if one string's longer than the other, it will just start overriding other random things, and the programming language itself won't care. So it's not, or it's weakly, a type-safe language. So the the term type safe is, uh, refers to whether it enforces rules on variables. So in Java, for example, you can't like copy a character into an integer without like, you know, casting it. So you can't just just like it will force you to um, put certain things in certain types of variables. Whereas in C, it'll just happily let you do weird things. Um, so you can't just copy like an integer into a string on in Java, but in C it'll let you do stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so the term type safe is whether the language enforces what you do with variables, basically. C is only weakly type safe. Okay, so another little crash course in C programming variables. Um, so in this example, on um, the example on um, the little arrow with a one on it, it says int space num1 comma num2 comma sum, and that's declaring three integers, so three numbers, three variables that, ho that hold numbers. So int stands for integer, and then we've just got a list of variable names. <coughs> Number two and three are just assigning values. So num1 equals 10 means the variable num1, store in that variable, what comes after the equal sign, basically. So the number 10 gets put into num1, num 15 gets put into num2. Then we've got sum equals num1 plus num2, which is basically the same thing. So we've got sum equals means put the value, store the value that comes after this in the variable called sum, and we've got num1 plus num2. And then we've got this printf line that says the sum of um, percent %d and percent %d is percent %d. Um, and then a new line, so the slash n means just put an, a, a new line at the end. 
and the percent %d's get replaced with those things that come after it. So num1 gets put in this percent %d, so it's going to print to the screen. The sum of num1, so 10, and num2, 15, is um, about 25. So it replaces each of those percent %d's, so those format string um, specifiers, with the values that come up to here. So that makes so any questions about that so far? All right. Um, reading input. So um, as we know, print printf is just printing out to the screen. So this is saying, please enter a number. And then there's a colon, a new line, and then a um, greater than symbol. So it's going to have a greater than symbol sitting on the screen. And then it's going to wait for the user to enter. Percent %d means an integer. So it's going to wait until they type in a number. And when they do that, it's going to store the value into num1. Um, and the, for now, um, I don't think I'll explain what that ampersand is. Um, uh, OK, so that the ampersand means um, rather than passing into this function the value of num1, it's passing in a reference to the variable so that scanf can put the result into that variable. So it's the, basically the information is flowing in the opposite direction. So please enter your name, and then again, it's going to wait till they enter a string, so percent %s, and it's going to store <laughs> the value into a name. So there's, some, there's an example of how you read from, from the user. Some conditions, so if sum is greater than 100, so then basically, I mean, it looks pretty straightforward. So you've got if, and then in brackets, what you're testing for, and then... Um, you know, in curly bra braces, you've got, you know, what happens if it's true. And then else, if something else happens, this code happens. Otherwise, this happens. Uh, and, you know, you can put any very, any code you want in there. So if the sum was greater than 100, then it was greater than 100. Uh, else, it was less than or equal to 100. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward, I think. So functions. <coughs> so the first thing that we've got on the... Um, yeah, okay, I'll start at number one. So we've got scanf percent 19, um, and then we've got this weird thing in, in um, square brackets that says um, caret slash n, which basically means it's a, it's a regular expression. So it means read from the user a string, it's the s that is up to 19 characters that isn't a new line, and store the value into name. And then we might do if validate name equals is valid. Um, then we print yay, otherwise we print damn. So it's just, this is checking by calling this other function. So validate name, so is this code here. So we've got validate is going to return an integer. Uh, it's receiving a string or a character array um, of an input. And if basically it does a comparison between input and the, the string cliff, and if that equals zero, which means it's the same, then it returns is valid, else it returns not valid. And those are just some um, constants I've defined at the top. So um, this is using a function within our code so that rather than having all of this code here, we can basically call that code. Um, so I think you've all done a bit of programming before, so hopefully that's making sense. Does anyone want to stop me with a question at this point? Um, Loops in C, so I'm, you know, obviously I'm running through all this code um, pretty quickly. Uh, so post test, we've got a do while loop. So if you've got a do while loop, it starts off and it does some stuff before it even checks whether something's true, and then at the end of doing the stuff, it checks whether it needs to continue. So it checks something, and if it's true, it does it again. So the post test loop will always happen at least once. Pre test. It checks the thing first. So we've got a while loop. So while something or rather is true, we'll do these things. So it might not happen at all. Is zero or more times. So it checks first before it does anything. If that condition was true, it does some stuff and it'll keep going as long as it's still true. Fixed iteration for loop is basically where we start off by uh, initializing a variable. So we might say, um, you know, i equals zero check the condition, so is i still less than 5 or whatever, and then um, we'll update the variable with like i++. So basically this is just going to go around, and each time it's going to add one 
to our um, like counter. So it'll do it five times or whatever. We just specify a counter and it will we'll keep doing that. Um, so that's C programming. Now you know how to write a C, C program. Um, so that was very much, uh, obviously, just a quick overview of the language. Um, if you feel like you didn't quite follow everything that I just said, then I do recommend, well, obviously, if you do the first lab, it is going to introduce those ideas to you in terms of actually practical work. But also, if you feel like you need to do a bit more on your C programming, Google's your friend. There's loads of tutorials. If you just pull up a tutorial, just, you know, there are just there's so many. You could just quickly run through a few tutorials if you weren't uh, comfortable with that. So basically, we've got a C program, and you've already seen a bunch of them because I've had them on the screen. It starts off as a .c file or and or um, .h files, <coughs> and the co compiler uses that code to create an executable, so the actual program that you can run on the computer. So if you've got a single .c file. You can compile a C program by using GCC, space, the, you know, whatever the name of your C file is, dash O, and whatever you want to call the program that you're compiling. So that's like the input.c, and then uh, I want the output to be, you know, output or whatever. Yes, Chris? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so C is not platform independent. So you can write C code that targets a Linux platform or targets like that, that will compile on a Linux platform or will compile on a Windows platform. There are some, like the codes I've shown you so far, will work on Windows or Linux, but most most libraries are specific. So like if you see something called Winsock, then you're probably it's a Windows um, Windows executable, like designed for a Windows machine, and um, if it's got like, um, so, yeah, I'm not sure whether that's um, available, yeah, but so it is, yeah, it's not, um, you can write C in C++ that is platform um, independent. So you can use um, what libraries like Qt, Qt, spelt Qt, which is actually great. I mean, I've done loads of Qt, Qt programming. Uh, and that is like a framework for C++ so that you can write code that compiles to Windows or Linux or Mac. Um, but otherwise, you, you'll, you can target towards the libraries that are available on different operating systems. Um, so yeah, just Google the library, I guess, and see whether or not it's it's available. But if you're trying to write code that's compatible across different platforms, so if it's a more complicated program, and there's a bunch of .c files and .h files. There's usually the ability to to um, the way that you would compile it is to to use like dot forward slash configure, and then run make, and then make install are the three commands you need in order to run like compile a complicated uh, C program, uh, and that will <coughs> basically generate the executables and install it onto your system. <coughs> so, um, if we try and compile the the, the um, example that I showed at the beginning, uh, it will give a warning because get s should never be used, uh, but it will also happily compile it for us. Um, so that you know, you, we can see here that this is. Um, you know, we can compile the program, GCC, <laughs> and then whatever the program's called, output, whatever we want it to be called. Um, there are all sorts of programming flaws that don't get fl flagged up by the compiler, which we will look at. Um, so what is machine code? So obviously, when you're looking at the C code, if you just take that .c file and stick it on a computer, you can't run it. It's just it it explains a program. It's not a program, right? Unlike other languages that might like PHP, for example, you've written your code. That's your program because it uses an interpreter. With C, you've got your code and you need to actually turn that into a program that a computer can understand. So, machine code are the instructions that a CPU can can actually execute directly, um, and all of the access to files and network resources and everything. 
uh, through system calls to the operating system. So the, um, the C code compiles down to machine code, which are instructions that run on the, C on the CPU. And whenever it tries to like access a file or something, it goes via the kernel. So it says, oh, I want to run a system call to open a file. And then the kernel, like the Linux or the Windows kernel, will basically say yes or no. Yes, you can open that file, and here's the contents. Um, so the actual machine code is specific to a CPU architecture. So you can write some C code and then compile it down to um, like uh, you know x86, like a Pentium code that you can run on you know your desktop computer. Or you can compile it down to ARM, which will only run on you know your mobile phone. Um, so you, you, you compile down to your machine code that's specific to a CPU architecture. So the command hex dump can show us this. So we can look at the first, just like this is just a little tiny segment of some um, machine code. Um, this is the contents of the ls command. And actually, um, the, 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 the actual file itself contains the machine code and some metadata and stuff. And if you did the malware lab last semester, you'll remember that um, the file format on Linux or, or Windows um, includes information about the program as well as the machine instructions that the, the actual um, CPU will, will actually run. So yeah, you can look at it. There's a bunch of zeros and ones, and you know, there's stuff in there. And a part of that are the instructions for the CPU. There's a sequence of opcodes and operands. So an opcode is like what you want it to do, and the operand is, you know, specifically what you want it to do. So um, does anyone here remember what a CPU register is? CPU register is like on a CPU. It has little small amounts of memory that it can store stuff into. Um, and all of the instructions for a CPU, often they'll be moving stuff around from memory into a register. And then if you want to add numbers, two numbers together, the CPU will like put two values in two registry, um, two, two registers, sorry. And then you can ask it to add those two together and put the, val the result into a separate register. So they're just like these tiny little memory compartments <coughs> built onto the CPU that you can, that the CPU reads to and writes from. So, Actually, a human reading and writing machine code as like zeros and ones or whatever, like incredibly, incredibly rare. It doesn't really happen. So assembly language is like the most basic programming language that exists that just describes the instructions for the CPU. So um, the reason why you might want to understand that for, for doing like security stuff is if you're actually trying to analyze a program that exists, either malware because you're trying to like, understand what malware is doing, or you're looking to understand exactly like a um, program mistake that was made. If you don't have the source code, you'll be looking at the assembly instructions of that program. So um, it's quite important if you're debugging software, native software. So we usually use mnemonics instead of the binary opcodes, instead of saying 0, 0, I don't know, you know, or even hex. We just use commands like move, add, compare, jump, pop. So those are like the basic instructions of a CPU, like move, um, you know, the the value from this register into this register. That's a basic instruction for a CPU. Uh, and there's two different ways you can write it. So there's basically two different formats you can use. There's at t and Intel. And um, usually for Windows, you use this, and for Linux, you use this. But it means basically exactly the same thing. It's just in a separate order, and there's different symbols. Essentially the same thing. Um, so some of the very most important ones to understand is MV, which is move. You've got stack instructions like push, so that puts something on top of the stack. You've got pop, which gets something off the stack. Um, call, which calls a procedure and return, which returns from a procedure. Um, and we've got different instru instructions we can use for adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing numbers, and jumping around within the code. So if you wanted to debug code, you can use uh, GDB. And there, these are the instructions, which are, is in the lab sheet. Um, and the um, basically, some important um, pieces of information is like the stack is like this place in memory that is like this static place where most variables and functions are stored. And the heap is this dynamic place. Um, and there are important CPU registers that kind of track the stack. 
So, um, so the the stack looks a bit like this. So it's the call stack. It's like this memory of area memory we use to track the program that's executing. So whenever a new function is called, this new frame is kind of added to the top of the stack. And it, one of the things that it stores is the return address so that when we finish the code, when we return from that function, it points to where we go next. Um, but also on the stack are like variables and, and, um, and things like that. So some important registers, which <coughs> are explained in, in the lab sheet, is the base pointer, which points to the bottom of the, the, the stack frame. We've got the, um, the ESP, which is the stack pointer, which is the top of the frame, and the EIP, which when we're doing buffer overflows is the most important, which is the address of the next instruction. So strings, um, like as I said before, there aren't these controls on it. So if you're trying to co copy something from source into a destination, it will basically store stuff and overwrite whatever's there. So when we do that to the stack, we can end up with what's known as stack smashing, where you basically overwrite the return pointer, and that is what a buffer overflow is. Basically, when we write too much into the stack, we end up overwriting the return address, which means that our code ends up jumping somewhere where it's not meant to jump. It's like blue stacks, you know, like one of those simulators where you can just download this one, you know, Linux and all around them. Is it something like that? I'm not aware of that specific piece of software, but <coughs> I'd be interested to. Is it like an emulator for it? Yes, uh, it's an emulator for the Android. Uh, okay. I, I've downloaded it on the laptop, and that way I can have a, mm -hmm. a, like WhatsApp, Viber, and all the. Uh, it's an actual uh, yeah. you know, Android phone on my laptop. Yeah, okay. I'm just aware that we're going to run over a little bit, so I'll just. Um, yeah. I'll just. There's not much left to say, so I'll just um, continue on. So. Um, if we carefully craft this input that's going to overwrite the stuff on the stack, we can do something known as um, shell, we can inject shellcode onto the stack and then point our pointer into it, or we can do what's known as arc injection. If we return overwrite that return value with somewhere else within the same code, we might make it jump to somewhere else in its own set of code, which might, might make something interesting happen. Um, so there's all sorts of things we can get to happen. So basically, it looks like this. So every time the um, a new function is called, the stack grows, and it contains a pointer to the return address. Now, when we're writing into a buffer, we can end up overriding local variables and things, which is what we saw in our very first example when I started the lecture. Um, but also, if we keep going, we can end up overriding the return address, and that's going to make the um, basically make the code jump somewhere else in memory. So a very basic kind of buffer, like stack smashing buffer overflow, would be you overwrite the buffer, and in that stuff that you're overwriting it with, you include the instructions that you want it to run, so the shell code, and then we basically perfectly craft it so that we're overwriting our return address to point at the start of our shell code, and then as soon as the, the function ends and it tries to jump back here, you'll see it jumps into our shell code and runs it. Um, which basically means that now we've got control over the computer because we can make that shellcode do anything, basically. So that's basically how buffer overflow works. But it's not always that straightforward, and it's actually really that straightforward. But it's a good place to start, and we'll talk a bit, a bit more in different weeks about that. But buffer overflow is one of the most common types of software vulnerabilities, and there's quite a nice little paper from 1996 mm -hmm. called stacking the, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, which gives an overview of that. So if we wanted to avoid that, basically we just need to not use unsafe libraries and make sure we use safe ones correctly. So use uh, instead of using stir copy, we use stir n copy, which means like copy a certain number of, you know, a certain amount out of a variable. And same for concatenate, never use get s. Um, and you also need to allow for a character at the end, but uh, that's all explained in the lab sheet as well. So that's basically the end of the lecture. Um, so we've covered introduction to C programming, assembly, debugging, um, security vulnerabilities. We talked about memory management. We just talked about what the stack is, what heap is, and all that. So um, yeah, hopefully that was a, um, a nice little introduction to the 
problem of buffer overflows. Uh, 